Hey there, Fiber Junkies. Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. Welcome, whether this is your first time or um, you've been watching since the beginning, I am really glad that you are here. So, today as I am filming, I have just a few things to talk to you about. And um, so I'm just gonna dive right in with some stuff that I've been working on lately, things I'm getting ready to cast on, what's going on in my life, and then we'll talk a little bit about the topic for today. So to start off, I was really excited because last week on the podcast, um, I think it was last week on the podcast, I showed you my Swamp Witch sweater was all done except I hadn't finished putting the buttons on. So I'm wearing it today. As you can see, um, we have these really awesome buttons here that I found at Joanne Fabrics, and they're just um, kind of an organic coconut shell that's been stained with this kind of mossy green color, which I thought went so beautifully with my Swamp Witch sweater. I really, really love these buttons. I think they're the perfect match for this thing. I wanted the Swamp Witch sweater, um, which for those of you who are maybe new this week, Swamp Witch is the colorway that I used um, for this yarn. This is my hand-dyed yarn, and it's a very busy speckle on kind of an earthy, mossy, brownish, greenish background. And so um, I wanted this sweater to feel very uh, woodsy and earthy, and I just wanted it to be a really great basic cardi that I could throw on with anything, and it wouldn't be like super fancy, you have to keep it really nice. I could throw it on to go tromping around the woods with my husband in the fall, or snuggle up on the sofa in front of the fire or where to work if I wanted to. So just kind of an everyday basic, which is why I chose the pattern that I did, um, which this is a free pattern on Ravelry called the Armand Cardigan by Andy Satterland. And I absolutely love that pattern. It's really, really fabulous and super easy. It has these awesome pockets in the front and then it's mostly just stockinette and a little bit of ribbing. So really, really simple, really great, uh, relatively quick knit in worsted weight yarn. So. I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about um, the next thing that I'm going to be knitting, what I want to cast on. So um, in case you don't already know, I am getting ready to go on vacation and I could not be more excited about this, you guys. I haven't been on like a legit vacation in probably four years or so. Um, it's been a while. My husband and I both work really hard at our jobs and he travels a lot with his job. So, and it's not the fun kind of travel, it's stressful working travel, um, but because of that, sometimes he just likes to be at home when he's home. Um, and then I have such a crazy job because when I'm not dyeing yarn, I'm a hairstylist, and I have uh, such a difficult time with my schedule taking off large chunks of time because of needing to be available for clients, and I'm a booth renter, so I have to pay for my space at my salon whether I am there working every day or not. I don't get a discount on months when I decide to go out of town for a week or two. Um, so it's always been hard for me to justify taking off and paying for space, but not actually having a lot coming in. But um, mostly it was just due to a lack of planning and just having our focus on other things like fixing up our house or trying to accomplish other things with our, our finances and time in the past. But this year we decided we would go on a vacation. And we actually decided it last year. So we've been, we spent almost a year saving up and planning. And I am so excited because we are going to go to Ireland for two weeks with um, a couple of our really good friends. So I am really, really excited. I have never been to Europe. I have never been to Ireland. And so I am so stoked because we both have a lot of uh, ancestors from Ireland. We both have Irish ancestry in our background. And so we're both really excited to just kind of see where part of our families came from, um, as well as I've just always felt very drawn to the Irish culture and um, to Ireland. It's been probably my number one, it's certainly in the top three destinations my whole life, um, maybe number one, but it was definitely in the top three. And Back when I was in my early 20s, I got to go twice to Australia, which was another one in my top three. So I'm about to scratch off number two on the top three list, and, and then I'll just have one more um, top spot. Can you guess where my last top spot is to go in my top three? With it, suffice it to say, I want to go everywhere in the world. So, you know, anywhere would be great. But I did my whole life have three top spots growing up that I wanted to travel to someday. And I'm so excited that I'm about to make the second one. So leave me a comment, let me know if you can guess what my last destination is that I would like to go more than any other place in the world. So, and I've already given you a hint because you already know I went to Australia. 
So let's talk about what I am going to be casting on. Now, I have been really struggling to come up with what I am going to take on the plane to knit while I'm in Ireland because I have to be careful. We do have limited space that we can pack stuff. Um, we're trying to keep our luggage to a minimum because we will be renting a car and driving kind of all around Ireland, really. We're not going to hit every single spot, of course, in two weeks, but we're going to hit as many as we can in two weeks. So we are going to be on the move a lot, and it just didn't seem like a good idea to have a lot of luggage. So I'm trying to really pare stuff down. Um, I'm probably going to be taking a lot of leggings and um, easy you know, no iron shirts and dresses and things. So I am hoping to limit as much as I can my luggage, but I know myself and I will break out in hives at the thought of not having something to knit, at least on the plane. And also we will be doing quite a bit of driving. And so I imagine there will be quite a bit of time spent in the car when I won't be driving that I will need to um, occupy my hands. Uh, I'm not really good at sitting still. So also I just thought it would be really fun to have a really extra special project to take with me when I am traveling around Ireland. So I've asked on the podcast and, uh, that you guys give me some ideas and suggestions and I had a couple great suggestions from people. I haven't entirely decided what I'm going to do yet. Hi Phoebe. <laughs> Phoebe is going to have to uh, be content by herself a lot while we're gone because we have three cats but when we're gone for long periods of time we really do have to keep them separate because the other two don't get along with Phoebe very well which is crazy because she's like the sweetest thing ever and I think that's why they're jealous because they're not the sweetest things ever they're they're really sweet cats to us but they have sometimes been a little less welcoming to other people <laughs> but Phoebe ne has never met a stranger she loves everybody don't you baby so Anyways, our cats are, you, you guys might send thoughts, prayers, light a candle for us if you think of it because our cats are not used to being left alone for that long. Um, they're used to Breck being gone for a month or more at a time with his job, but I'm usually still here. And then on rare occasions when I go out to visit him or we both happen to be gone different directions, it's usually only for a couple of days. So um, I'm not sure how they're going to do with not having mom and dad for two whole weeks. So hopefully they'll be good. But um, like I was saying, I have mentioned on the podcast before that I wanted help and you guys had offered some great suggestions for what I should take to knit. And I still haven't entirely worked out everything that I'm doing, but I think what I'm going to do is an easy but not completely vanilla pair of socks. Um, I'm going to cast on a new pair, I think, before we head out. And I'm leaning towards doing a free pattern on Ravelry that's called Socks on a Plane. Um, I'm trying to decide between that one and I think the other one is called Scatterbee Socks. I haven't decided yet, but I want something that's like easier. It, it's easy and relatively simple to memorize and take the pattern along um, for when I just want to have a little tiny project in my purse but I don't want to have it be, I'm okay with just plain vanilla if I can't make this work, but I think I wanted to do something just a little bit more exciting than just plain vanilla again. Because I'm just finishing up a pair of plain vanilla socks that I showed last week on the podcast with my sock blank, and I have done quite a few plain vanilla pairs in the last six months, so I'm kind of wanting to branch out and do some other fun things. And last week I also showed another pair of socks in my Victorian pinup colorway that was the charade pattern. And um, that one was awesome because it was super easy to memorize. I didn't need to have the pattern printed out and constantly with me. I could just kind of go for a while without thinking and just working in pattern. But it was more exciting than just plain old stock in it or just plain old ribbing. So I want something kind of like that again, something simple and fun, not too difficult um, that I can use as socks. I'm also really wanting to take along a multicolor shawl project because I really love shawls. I've been having a lot of fun with those, but I'm struggling with how much room I'm gonna have. So the shawl is a maybe. I'm hoping I can find a simple, not too difficult shawl pattern I can work out. And I'm actually, I've kind of narrowed it down to two shawl patterns. The problem I'm having though is I don't know if it's actually a good idea long-term because I don't want to have too many balls of yarn with me, like too many separate skeins. And both of the shawl patterns that I really love are kind of big cushy shawls. And so they've got, you know, four or five colors per shawl. Um, so the two that I'm thinking about are, uh, the first one is a fade project. And I really resisted the find your fade thing about a year ago, year and a half ago, when it first came out. Because the find your fade pattern to me, and this is not meant towards offense to anyone that has 
designed it or made it <laughs> because I think it, it is a great concept and is a great pattern. And I've seen some absolutely gorgeous find your fade shawls from some of you guys out there as well as all over the internet. Um, and the concept is really fun and I see why people like it and why they get obsessed and do like multiple fades. But I just don't really like the shape and styling of the find your fade. I did do two fade sweaters, which I've shown on the podcast, the So Faded and the Comfort Fade, but I haven't done any of the shawls yet. And so after some deliberation, I'm leaning towards doing What the Fade because that one is the shawl pattern that the shape of it and having the brioche with it really was kind of more my thing and more my style. So I'm leaning towards doing that one, but again, that would probably take at least three or four colors, possibly more, and I don't know if I want to lug all that with me. Um, and then the other one that I'm thinking about doing is called You Rock, and it's E-W-E, -E, as in a sheep U. You Rock, uh, and that's by Suzanne Summers. And I am working on the mysteries she wrote, which I've showed on the podcast a couple of times before. I'm getting close to finishing. I am picking up an incredibly long border all around the edges right now. But I just really love Suzanne Summers' patterns. I started with her Love You Baby shawl a couple years ago, or just about a year ago, I guess. And then um, I have now almost finished Mystery She Wrote, which I've loved even better than the first one I did. And now I'm seriously thinking about doing her You Rock shawl, which is kind of a fade style. You still fade in like four different colors, and it just has some really fun shaping to it that I think would be awesome. So I'm kind of wanting to try that. But like I said, it's going to depend on if I have room in my suitcase and if I can pick out yarn that I like for it before I go. Um, and I might pare down and just do a simple like two color shawl and do something a little bit simpler or even a one color shawl that's just a little bit simpler just so I don't have to take so many skeins to juggle. But let me show you some colors. Sorry, Phoebe. I have been thinking about, well, I knew I wanted to cast on another sweater. I'm more of a garment knitter, honestly, than anything. Although you wouldn't know it over the last year with uh, launching Potion Yarns and getting that up and running, I have been doing a ton of shawls because I find them easier without having to worry about swatching and gauge isn't really a huge important issue and I feel like you can never have too many shawls, but also they just really show off colors really well of my hand dyed yarn. So I've been knitting a lot of shop samples as well as working with um, indie dyed yarn from other people that I've gotten. But I definitely knew I wanted to cast on a sweater for Ireland. So my big project is going to be a sweater, little project is socks, and then I'm hoping to have a medium project and do a shawl, but we'll see. But I finally, um, it was taking me a really long time to sift through patterns and I finally narrowed it down to two patterns that I'm tr struggling to decide which one to cast on and I have yarn picked out already for both of them. And then my third choice is a much smaller little short sleeve garment, more like a little blouse that I'm wanting to cast on and I'm still on the fence about whether or not I'm going to cast that on and take with me or just cast on and leave here so that when I come back I have something already on the needles and going. But let's look at the yarn I've picked out. So the two that I can't decide between, but definitely one of them is coming with me, are both by Caitlin Hunter, who does Boyland Knitworks. I haven't knit any of her patterns yet, but I have purchased like four. <laughs> and I realized recently that I might have a slight problem when I was trying to pick what I was going to bring with me to Ireland. Um, I do have a knitting book collection but I was at work and didn't have access to my book collection when I had a break and decided I was going to try to figure out what to pack to go to Ireland. So I started looking through my Ravelry library thinking, I've bought tons of patterns that I've never even knit, plus I have a bunch of free patterns. I don't need to look up new patterns. Let's just go through the stash of patterns on Ravelry and see what I have that strikes my fancy, and then I'll see if I have yarn to go with it. And through that process, I discovered that I have way too many patterns in my uh, Ravelry library that I have way too many that I have purchased or been given that I have not knit yet <laughs> and that I really need to buckle down and get going. And yet, despite all of that, I went out and bought five, not, not one, but five more patterns, you guys. <laughs> five last night. <sighs> that Part of that is because, though, one of them was on a buy three, get the fourth free. Caitlin Hunter is doing buy three, get the fourth free right now. So... You might want to go check that out and you don't need a coupon code you just put three of her patterns in your or put four patterns in your cart and the cheapest one you get for free so anyways i decided to stock up on some of her patterns because i have been drooling over her instagram and i keep seeing people casting on all these amazing sweaters and cowls and socks and things actually i don't think she's done socks but i keep seeing all these amazing things she has done that people keep casting on and being like i gotta get in on that 
So I've narrowed it down to two of her sweater patterns that I can't decide what I want to do. The first one is the Zweig sweater. And that's the one that if you are on Instagram at all, you've probably seen a million and one people casting this on lately. Um, it is so freaking gorgeous. I can't believe it. I'm obsessed. And I've been wanting to cast it on for a couple months now because a while back, several podcasters I really liked were knitting it on their podcasts and it just looks so pretty. And every time I'd get on the Ravelry page and look at the different um, projects that people were doing, I could not pick a single favorite um, of people's color choices. Literally everything I saw looked good. And you know that's a sign of a great pattern when every color choice you see looks at least good, if not amazing. And the huge majority of them, I'd say 80% of the patterns I saw in Ravelry, I was like, oh my God, that's drop dead gorgeous. I would 100% straight up pay a lot of money to buy that in the store. So um, I had a really hard time with picking colors, but I finally chose some. And I have decided to use my Lady Absinthe colorway from my shop. This is the Foxy Sock. So it's 80% um, Superwash Merino, 20% Nylon. And this is the Lady Absinthe colorway. It's just a chartreuse kind of brilliant green tonal. It's, it's very light and I would say it's more of a chartreuse than a lime because it's a little bit lighter and brighter, but it's it's not quite neons yet. It's pretty bright, but it's not really neon. But I am obsessed with this colorway, you guys. Um, you've actually seen it on the podcast before if you've been watching for a while, because I used one of these colors, or one of these skeins of Foxy, on my Oracle shawl that I was knitting by, um, oh my gosh, I just blanked out her name, Kristen, of the Woolen Vine Yarns and the Yarngasm podcast. Uh, I purchased her pattern a while back and I knit the full moon oracle, which I loved and still haven't blocked you guys. That was like months ago and I still haven't blocked it. But um, I used this colorway as one of my colors in that shawl. And then I loved it so much, I dyed up some sport weight yarn that I was gonna make the Sherlock Lives Cardi. I haven't cast on yet. I actually am thinking about taking that one to Ireland as well. That's another idea. But the problem is that one is a free pattern and the way that it's, so it only comes in one size. And the way that it's written, I don't think I'm going to do it quite as written. I think I'm going to make some adjustments. And so I am going to have to do a lot of like math and charting stuff out on paper. And I just don't think I want to mess with that when I'm traveling. So I'm leaning towards not starting that until I get back. And I'm also thinking on that note, on the Sherlock Lives cardigan, which I think I'm going to do a cardigan. I might do a pullover, but I'm leaning towards cardigan. But anyways, on that um, Sherlock Lives pattern, which you can find on Ravelry, I am, I'm really thinking that I'm going to, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of doing um, an interactive kind of, almost like a series on our podcast. I don't know how many videos it would actually be, but at least just tracking through the podcast, tracking my progress on kind of swatching and maybe redesigning a little bit and making some stuff work out for that pattern. I was thinking it would be really fun to do that on here and show you guys my progress as I'm going through it so that you could kind of, you could get the pattern and some yarn and follow along with it if you want to do your own calculations for your own body measurements with me and I'll, I'll kind of break it down for you. Or you can just watch how I'm doing it and maybe get inspired to play around with some patterns that you're interested in but you don't know if the fit is quite right or they don't have your size or you want to make a pullover into a cardigan or vice versa or something like that. So let me know if you think that's a good idea because I'm seriously thinking that that would be a really fun, exciting way for us to learn and grow on our knitting journey and maybe would light a fire under me to get started on that when I get back because I've really just put it off because I've been so busy lately and I just don't have the time to sit down and actually make the swatch and start doing all the hard math and redesigning. But back to the Zwag. So I've been using this color a lot and I've been wanting to use it even more. <laughs> I keep looking at it and being like, oh my gosh, I just love this stuff. Um, so yeah, this is going to be the body of my sweater. And then the contrast, there's a contrast lace panel through the yoke, um, kind of around the chest area. And I am going to do my white and black speckle. It just has like black speckles on a white background, um, black and gray. And this is called Stop the Presses because it reminds me of a typewriter. And I think that is going to look absolutely stunning with the green. Don't you think? And I love this color. I will wear this all the time, no matter what color my hair is. It's my legit favorite. Um, and this one just looks, it just felt very like graphic and bold and like clean. 
And um, I've seen a lot of people using speckled yarns, even fairly heavy speckles for the lace pattern in Zweig, and I think it's going to be really, really cool. So super excited. It was a very tough call because I had about six combinations that I was like, this would look great. And I want a red Zweig and a green Zweig and a black and white Zweig. And like, I want, I want this sweater in multiple colors, but I should probably start with just one. So that's option A. Option B, which is also by uh, Caitlin Hunter, is the Sunset Highway uh, Pullover. So this one is another like long sleeve pullover with a color work yoke and then um, a stockinette body that's one main color. Now, as I was going through stash, I was really struggling with colors on this one. This one took me a lot longer to pick out colors, but I feel pretty excited about what I ended up choosing. Um, one of my issues that I had though is I really wanted both of these sweaters to be knit with only indie dyed yarn or mostly indie dyed yarn with maybe like a solid color if I needed to for some of the color work or something. But I wanted it to mostly, if not completely, be indie dyed yarn. Not even necessarily my indie dyed yarn, but handmade, artisan crafted. I wanted these sweaters to be really special projects for me. So I chose not only some of my favorite colors from my stash to knit my swag, but then I chose some um, some of my favorite colors that I had in my yarn stash from other indie dyers and was trying to put together color palettes. But my issue that I was running into is that I have a lot of indie dyed yarn where I only have one skein or um, there were a couple that I had two skeins of the same colorway, but it was like still just not quite enough that I needed for the body. But mostly I just had single skeins. And um, so I was really struggling. I finally ended up deciding to do a fade pattern for the body that is all one main color at the bottom of this sweater and use two really similar but not quite matching skeins from the same dyer and just kind of either stripe or fade in the um, one color into the next because I think it's gonna look really, really great. And they're so close that I don't think it'll be a big shift. So you'll probably recognize these, except they're all caked up now, but a couple weeks ago on the podcast, I mentioned that I had had a really rough time um, back in March and that I needed some retail therapy. And one of my favorite indie dyers that I've been stocking but hadn't purchased from before had come out with some amazing fading point kits, which if you're not familiar with fading point, that is a pattern by Hohi Locatelli that is a really massive rectangular shawl or wrap. And it's a beautiful pattern, but I honestly, the yarn that I bought from this indie dyer is so gorgeous. I just didn't think that I wanted to use it on a big wrap like that, that I wasn't sure how often I would get to use it. I kind of wanted to use it more on like a, a garment or something very special that I'll use a lot more. So I decided to use my fading point kit from Brittany at Machete Shop. Um, to make my Sunset Highway. So what I have here are the two lightest colors and it's probably a little hard to see right now where they're at, but if you can see, they're very close. This one is a white background and it has a couple different shades of pink and um, some green and purple and blue speckles, but it's the overwhelming color is white and pink on this one. And then this one is another speckle. It's a little bit heavier of a speckle. And the background color is a super soft, almost not there pastel, like peach color. And then it has some bright, fun, poppy neon speckles over that. So we have a peach and a pink, and they were very close together. And I figured, you know what? I think at the bottom of the Sunset Highway, there's color work up here. And then on the sleeves and the body, you have big sections of stockinette. Um, that kind of ground the sweater and give it a really nice background. And as I looked through the project gallery on Ravelry and looked at several other people's color choices, I found that I was most drawn to kind of a light body with darker color work at the top. Although I did see some stunning options where that was flipped or even it was kind of all light or all dark. Um, but my favorite was the, the lighter speckled body with some deeper color work at the top. So that's kind of where I went. I actually was wanting, wishing that I had two of this peachy speckle, which is called kombucha brew. Um, I was wishing I had more of this and I actually even got on um, Machete shop and was like, you know, I would pay extra shipping if she had any already dyed up of the single skeins of either this one or the grassroots colorway from that same set, which is this amazing like chartreuse green with speckles. Um, if she'd had any more of either of these, I would have ordered a couple more skeins and just paid extra shipping to get them priority mail sent to me really fast um, because these were my favorite two from the set that I bought. But unfortunately, she was sold out of them on her website, and I knew that even if 
I asked her she would probably have to like dye it up and everything else and so I decided I really wanted to to potentially take this one to Ireland, so I would just make do with what I had. And I think my fade idea is a really great idea. So that'll be the body. And then as we've already seen, this grassroots colorway, which was my very favorite from that set, is going to be one of my um, color work options up top, as well as Blanca, which is also from that set. So all four of these yarns were in a set together. And then I chose, I needed something dark and not incredibly busy so preferably not a speckle more of like a semi-solid or a solid for some of the color work between color work sections there's um, a skinny little section of a couple rows that kind of create outlines and so they just separate the panels and give it a really nice grounding effect and so I chose um, a partial skein but it's mostly there I've only used a tiny bit of this one so it's the majority of a skein of Madeline Tosh Merino Light which is her single ply and this colorway is called Kale. I don't know if you can see that, but it's like a deep purpley aubergine kind of eggplanty color with some lighter browns and grays and some kind of a deep black wash over the whole thing. And it's just really, really gorgeous. So I think that is going to really ground these brighter colors in the color work very nicely. And then against the speckle, I don't know if you can see all that. I'm having trouble holding all my yarn, you guys against the speckle, I think it's going to be really fantastic. So that's my Sunset Highway. Hi, baby. Phoebe's my little acrobat back there. So now the tricky part is, okay, which one do I take to Ireland? I want to take them both, but I know that that's madness. I'm leaning towards doing Zweig first, I think. Um, I just kind of feel like it'll be a little bit less. With only two colors, I feel like it's going to be less to be juggling around. So I'm leaning towards doing Zweig. I am still considering the Sunset Highway though, partly because the four of the colors that I got in there were my kind of treat myself, very, very special purchase yarns that I just got from a uh, machete shop. And I really want to do something special with them. So I think that not only will this pattern be special, but I also think that taking them to Ireland would be really, really special. But I also love the idea of knitting a mostly green sweater in Ireland with my own yarn on that trip. So. I don't know, what do you think I should do? I'm really a little bit torn on it. Again, I'm leaning towards Zweig, but I'm not entirely sure. So let me know which one you think I ought to do. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the topic for the podcast today, now that we've chatted about what I'm going to be taking to Ireland with me. Um, and by the way, Irish knitters out there or anyone who's been to Ireland, let me know if you have a favorite yarn shop or place where I can pick up some special yarn, um, preferably something local, either locally raised or um, some local hand dyers over there. I would love to get a, a skein of Irish hand dyed yarn while I'm over there. And I know there are some great hand dyers in Ireland. I just don't know where I'd go to get their stuff because I think they're mostly online. Um, but yeah, let me know if you have a favorite uh, yarn shop or spot where you recommend me looking for yarn while I'm over there. Leave me a comment below because I would love to get a little bit of a chance to do that. And a large part of why I'm going to Ireland is for inspiration as well for my dye pots. So definitely for sure let me know what I can be, um, let me know what I can shop for there and then I can feel like I'm doing some more work while I'm there even though it's mostly mostly for just fun. Okay, so here's our topic for today. I wanted to bring up the idea of swatching with you guys again. We talked about swatching a little bit last week on the, actually quite a bit last week on the podcast. That was kind of the whole theme, was swatching your hand-dyed yarns so that you could get a feel for how they work up in specific stitch patterns or over certain numbers of stitches uh, so that you can plan how to use them to their best ability. And today I kind of have, I guess you could say it's more of a public service announcement, honestly. Um, this is designed, today's topic is designed to help you, the consumer, when you are purchasing Indie Dyed Yarn, to know what you're looking for and what you can expect from your dyer. And then it's also to help myself and fellow dyers, uh, help the, the Indie Dyer industry, to communicate some of the things that we wish that you guys knew about our perspective. So I wanna give you guys a little glimpse into the mind of a dyer, as well as um, kinda of answer a common complaint that I hear from a lot of people online about purchasing yarn online. And this is specifically going to refer to indie dyed yarn, but this is really kinda of true across the board. And that is the concept of, have you ever asked that question of a dyer or wondered and wanted to ask the question of an indie dyer, 
why don't you guys knit up more swatches of all of your different colorways on your website so I can see what they look like and I can know if I want to buy your yarn, right? Seems like a legit question. So let's talk about that a little bit. As an indie dyer, one of the very first things that I got asked as soon as I had a shop launched, even before I had a shop launched actually, once people knew that I was doing this, a couple of friends would even say this, but one of the very first things I got asked and then have gotten asked probably more than just about any other question is, have you considered knitting up swatches of all your different colorways so people can see what they look like? And so let me assure you, as a consumer, I realize that you're only going off of your own perspective, so this is not meant as like a slap down to anybody, but just being completely honest, yes, I guarantee you that every single indie dyer out there, if they have an online shop at least, if they don't sell online, that might be another conversation, but if they have a website and an online shop at all, and probably even if they don't, I guarantee you they have had this thought. Why? Because A, most of them, are or were before they became dyers, or maybe after they became dyers, became knitters or crocheters, weavers, etc. We're all fiber artists to a degree. Even some people I know barely knit with their own yarns or anybody else's. They, bar they just do enough to like maybe knit a swatch every now and then or make a simple scarf or a simple easy project. They don't do it a ton. They mostly focus on the dyeing and selling. That's totally cool. But the huge majority of indie dyers that I know, regardless of how successful their business is or how long they've been doing it or how much they sell, most of them knit or crochet or spin or weave or something in addition to just dyeing yarn. In fact, for most of us, that's how we got into it was because we were already immersed in the community and loving yarn, loving color, loving pattern, loving working with it and wanted to make that into either a side hobby business or a full-blown career. So because all of us are fiber artists already, or at least know what we're doing, we know that it's really helpful to see how something knits up. We know that it doesn't look the same in the skein as it does knit up. And we know you know that. So that brings me to point B. We're also salespeople. Our job, our goal is to get you to fall in love with our yarn so much that you can't stand it and you have to have it right now and you buy it and then you make something beautiful with it as well. So our goal isn't to have yarn just sitting around. Our goal is to move yarn. As soon as we get it dyed and listed, we would like it to sell, at least reasonably quickly. As soon as we get to a show and get all set up at a craft fair or a yarn show, we want you to come through and buy our stuff. That's why we're there. So we know that it makes the most sense to demonstrate our product as much as possible and to give you examples as much as possible. So of course it's crossed our minds. So the first reason that we don't knit up swatches is frankly, we just don't have time. Most of us are one woman or one man operations. Most of us are on our own. If we have any help, it's quite likely a spouse or a kid or a best friend or a sister or someone who helps us part time either for no money, just out of the goodness of their heart or for in exchange for yarn or maybe a small amount of, of money, but we don't have steady employees. Even the larger companies that can afford to hire one or two employees or even a couple more, um, frankly, everyone who's an employee is busy doing the actual running of the business. And until you run that business or something similar, you'll have no idea how much time that actually takes. Because not only do I have to dye yarn, I have to keep up inventory, make orders for new inventory constantly. I have to constantly clean my kitchen and my house because dye gets everywhere and there's little particles that are so microscopic you can't see them and they go through the air and then they settle on something and so you could have just bleached that countertop and then you come back an hour later and there's little blue speckles everywhere and you have to bleach it again. So it's constantly cleaning, constantly dyeing, and then in addition, we have all of the running of the website and taking photos and listing things, knitting samples, applying to shows, getting all the other stuff we need to run our business like packing and shipping supplies, like all of the equipment, everything that we use. There's just, I could go on and on for days about the expenses and the time consuming things that an indie dyer has to do. So now imagine trying to fit into that, knitting up swatches. It's not a huge priority for us. We frankly just have so many other things to do. It's hard to find time as it is. Now, some dyers are better about this than others. They limit their colorways. They don't have as many things come out. Maybe they limit their shop updates and they don't have as much coming to the shop or going out of the shop. Um, and maybe they just prioritize that because to them it's important. 
If so, more power to them. That's awesome. It's so good for them. And I'm constantly in awe of those kinds of people because I don't know how they find the time to knit swatches or ask other people to knit them for them. That's a lot. So if you find someone like that, be incredibly grateful and we'll all marvel at how they do that because I don't know how they do that. <laughs> I don't have time. I really struggled last week to show the like two or three swatches that I showed on the podcast. That was hard for me, um, and it really didn't take that much time to do the actual knitting of the swatch, but I had to set aside time, I had to knit it, I had to block it, so I could show it on the podcast, and at least on this one, it feels like it's very, um, it's very important, and it's very, I don't know, I feel like there's more than just, that's something I can show on the website, but it's more than just that, it's for the podcast as well, and even that has been hard for me. I wanted to knit up swatches for my talk today, actually. Um, and didn't get a chance to do it. So we're gonna proceed without swatches because I just don't have the time to do it every week. So that's the first reason, we just don't have time. So then the net obvious question after that is, well, why don't you hire someone or ask someone to do it for you? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a ton of friends who just love knitting swatches all day long and want to just do it, especially when they don't get to keep the swatch or the yarn. So that brings up the problem of who do you find to do it? Well, as a small maker business myself, I strongly believe in um, paying fair wages for fair work. So if I'm going to ask someone to knit a swatch, which we all know is boring as hell, right? Um, I'm going to need to pay them at least a little something. Um, and I believe in paying as well as I possibly can. I don't, I know how hard it is to knit and to knit good swatches and on a deadline and everything else. So I would expect to pay for that. That's a business expense that right now I frankly can't afford. I can't afford to pay myself solid wages at this point, um, at least not a living wage consistently. So until I can get to the point where I can at least pay myself consistently a living wage, in addition to paying all my expenses and not going into debt as a business, then maybe I can think about hiring out some contract work like knitting some swatches. Right now, that's not something that I can afford to do. All of my money goes back into the business or goes to pay myself a small amount, but not enough to survive on. So that's where we're at with that. So I can't hire it done. Um, and then the next obvious question is, well, you could pay them in yarn if you found someone who really liked to knit or crochet, right? Absolutely, I could. That's a great way to do it. And I know a lot of dyers who do that. They will give someone a couple skeins of yarn, ask them to knit or crochet up several samples. Um, either full projects or a swatch, and then they put that on their website, take it to shows, etc. That's a great option, again, if you can afford it, because where does that yarn come from? That's right, it comes from my business expenses, so that's another business expense. Now that's a better one than paying outright cash, but it's still kind of a large expense, especially if we're going to try to knit swatches for every colorway we have. That brings us to the next point. It is impossible for me to knit swatches of every colorway I have. Some dyers limit themselves and they only have maybe eight or 10 colorways for like a year or whatever in their shop. That is more doable. That I could probably get swatches knit for. That's not how I roll and that's not, frankly not how most of the dyers I know roll. This is one of those businesses, any retail business is like this, where you have to keep new things constantly before your audience, not to mention that you're working with a group of highly creative artists and we aren't content to just dye the same thing every day, all day, over and over. Now I have some colorways, like Lady Absinthe, I could happily dye this every week and still not get tired of looking at it. It's literally like one of my very favorite colors in the shop. but. I can't just dye that, and I frankly don't even want to. As much as I love that and wouldn't mind dyeing it every week even, I don't wanna dye it literally just that for a while. So we're constantly coming up with new colorways and new things, and so to keep up with that would be ridiculous. And again, the more colorways you have and the more swatches you need, the higher your expense because now you're having to donate skeins of yarn or pay someone for each of those colorways, and that's a lot. That brings us to our next point, which is, okay, so let's say that's that's not going to work. Let's say we don't hire anybody out. We understand all of that. Well, well, couldn't you just, couldn't you just knit them? As we already talked about, I don't have time. The other reason I can't just knit them is it's still costing me money to knit them myself. This wag sweater is costing me money. My personal finances have to pay my business back for at least the wholesale cost, if not the full retail cost of this yarn, because now this is yarn that I can't sell in my shop. 
Now I'm happy to do that because this will probably be a sample. It'll also be something I wear to shows um, so I can show off my yarn colorways. It's also something I can wear on the podcast. I can put photos up of it. So in a way it is a business expense. I can justify it in certain amounts like that, or I can pay myself from my personal finances into my business, which I occasionally do as well, depending on what I'm knitting and how much I will use it for the actual shop. But to knit a swatch, I need to take a skein of yarn. And in order to do that, I am then wasting, to knit up say a four by four swatch, you're not gonna use that much yarn, right? So it doesn't seem like a lot of yarn, but now that whole skein of yarn is unsellable. I have to make break it down and make it into minis, or I have to sell it as a partial skein, which I don't really do in my shop, or I have to use it for something else. Which is why last week on the podcast, I showed you swatches knit from uh, my Victorian pinup colorway. The reason I chose that was because I had just completed a pair of socks using that yarn, and I had some significant leftovers, and I thought this is more than enough for two or three swatches, and I'll still have a little bit left over. And so that's why I chose that colorway. Just happen to have it on hand and it might as well use up something rather than taking a whole other skein of yarn. So that's another issue. Even if I'm just paying my test knitters in yarn, I have to basically give them an entire swatch for each colorway I want, or excuse me, an entire skein for each colorway that I want swatched up because I can't sell a partial skein unless I break it down into minis, which again requires additional equipment and additional time. So let's go on to another point that someone else has raised to me. Couldn't you just dye up minis of those colorways and then just use a mini to knit a swatch? Yes, and that's actually the most practical suggestion I have heard yet. That one might work, and it's worked for me on a couple of occasions when I've been able to knit up something, but frankly, I don't dye a lot of minis, so that's another expense. I don't keep them around on hand all the time, so I don't have them in the shop very often. So then that's leading me to, well, then I have to make sure that I'm purchasing minis or purchasing yarns that I can make into minis and then dyeing those and then knitting those. And again, we come back to the whole cost and time thing because that's still yarn that I have to pay for and dye up separately. Um, There's also the issue that I've had with some minis, depending on which recipes I'm doing, some of my yarn recipes, because of the way they are dyed, won't mimic the results of a full skein um, if you do it in a mini. So you would almost have to do it as a full skein because they're a different put up size and put up just refers to how they come to me. So they come to me in a skein that's say, you know, this large, this big around, and then other yarns that I have come in a skein that's maybe this big around, and my minis maybe come in this big around. So based on my dyeing methods, there are some of them it won't matter what size around it is, it'll still look the same knit up. Other ones, it matters because you place the color a specific way and because of the dye process it's going to look different on a mini with a circumference this big than a full size skein with a circumference this big. It will just knit up differently and if the whole point is to show off how the full skein knits up then I have to use a full skein. So that's another issue with that. Although again like I said that's a pretty good workaround. The mini is a good compromise but we're back to the whole do I have time, do I have money, etc. Okay so let's go on to yet another point and this one to me is the best point of all so please take note of this and feel free to share it with anybody who you find may still need help understanding this um i was hoping to show this on the podcast with some swatches knit up from the same colorway and i did not get that done but i know you guys are advanced enough knitters and crocheters that you can use your imagination and figure out how this will work first off let's talk about that knitters crocheters and weavers Um, The majority of my customers are knitters, I believe, but I do have quite a few crochet folk. I only have a couple weavers, but I do have a few. And I'm sure that there are some other people using my yarns for other types of fiber crafts out there. At least I certainly hope so, and I think that would be awesome if they did. Um, So definitely you can use it in different ways, but even if I were to knit up swatches of all my colorways, then what about the crochet folk? What about the weavers? They're out in the cold. They want to see examples of their type of art done up with my yarns. So in order to do that, I would have to knit, crochet, and weave, and possibly needle felt or any other type of project I could come up with. I would have to do all of those for all of my yarns. Also, any kind of felting isn't going to work with most of my yarns because I mostly use superwash, although I'm thinking about getting some non-superwash, but we'll see. So again, even if I were to knit them all up, then the crocheters and the weavers are out in the cold, right? Um, Even if I were to spin up some of my roving and show you how it spins, 
there's so many different ways to spin. It's gonna look different for each and every person. Now, I find that more advanced knitters and crocheters have no problem. Usually the people who are asking me for swatches are beginners or newer knitters and crocheters. And again, there's nothing wrong with being a beginner and we all started that way and it's totally okay if you did, it's not a big deal. But I find that the more advanced fiber artists tend to be better at visualizing how things will work up, which makes sense. The more experience you have, the better able you are to guess how things will work up. But, um, there's still a little bit of struggle between the cross craftual divide there. So that's another issue I have. And then the final point is that it really doesn't help me to knit you a swatch. It really doesn't. And this is what I cannot stress enough. Swatch knitting is basically important for testing your gauge and or testing your yarn choice with a stitch pattern, not with the overall pattern per se. It can help with that. But what you have to keep in mind is a semi-solid like Lady Absinthe, it won't matter whether you knit it two inches wide, four inches wide, or 36 inches wide, it will look pretty much the same. Now there might be some slight variations on it, but it will look pretty much the same across the board because it's a semi-solid. It doesn't have a lot of color changes and it won't dramatically affect how the color looks based on how wide it is. But if you have something, I don't have a great option even with me, but if you have something like a heavy speckle like Blanca here, or let's say you have a variegated yarn like Victorian Pinup that I showed on the uh, podcast last week, um, which is a variegated yarn. So you have like a, a strand of black for a few inches and then it changes into a lavender and then changes into a cranberry and then changes into a gray, right? So you have different distinct colors in the same skein and it'll just go for however many inches of one color before switching to another. So when that's the case, it does not help you to knit a four inch swatch unless your project is also four inches, in which case it will help you. It might help you on socks or other small projects, but it will not help you on your large sweater knit in the round where you knit a cardigan body, both sides and the back all in one piece. It's going to look dramatically different because those color runs, let's say you have three inch runs of color and you've got six colors. So you've got three inches per color six different times before it starts back again on another color. If you're doing that, um, it's going to look dramatically different if you have three inches and let's say your project, let's say you're knitting a, a sock and your sock is about three to, three to four inches wide, right? We'll say four inches wide. So you're gonna have a solid color of black, say, running for the majority, three quarters of that front of the sock is going to be black and then you're gonna start fading into lavender at the end of it and then it, as it goes around the back, it'll be lavender into cranberry, right? So you're gonna have a large section of black. Um, and then depending on how your yarn is dyed, it may pool and you may have several inches vertically of black, or it may stripe a little more and you have black next to cranberry, next to lavender, next to gray, next to black, whatever it is. Um, let's say you extend that out now and you're knitting a shawl and you're doing a shawl that has a long side that's, let's say it's 12 inches long. 12 inches is quite a bit different than three. You're gonna see the color shifting. You're gonna see a longer stretch of multiple color shifts as opposed to the socks where you might have black and a little bit of purple, black and a little bit of purple, right? So you're not gonna be able to get an accurate idea of how it knits up because for certain colorways, and every colorway is different, but for some colorways, if you knit them into a pair of socks, you will see distinct pooling. And if you're not sure what pooling is, it's basically where you see a large section of color. So you see a big bunch of green instead of just little flashes of green throughout. This kind of a colorway that has speckles all over it is not going to pool because it has little flashes of color throughout. Some variegated skeins are not going to pool because the color runs are so short, they're only an inch or two long. So you won't see the color pool up very much. Um, you'll just see flashes of color. Whereas some with longer color runs or a shorter circumference like a sock or a shorter distance is you might see more pooling than if you stretch it out over a shawl. I hope that makes sense. So that's the main reason to me why it wouldn't matter if I knit you a swatch because how many of the, how much of the time are you knitting a three or four inch project out of my yarn? You might be, you might be knitting socks and that gives you a good idea, but you might be knitting a shawl or a scarf or maybe you're knitting socks on a different angle. You're doing some of those modular socks where you knit them flat and then seam them up or you knit them from an angle from the heel coming out or whatever it is. There are so many different ways to knit socks and every different 
type of pattern and type of construction is going to change. If you knit your sweater body, like my Armand cardigan, if you knit that in the round like I did where you have two fronts and the back of the cardigan connected so it's like one big long circular needle and you just work back and forth like that, your color will react differently than if you knit in the round for a pullover like that. And it will react differently if you knit your cardigan in pieces. So you have one piece for the fronts, for each of the fronts, and then a separate piece for the back. And you just knit the back up like this and then knit the fronts up like this. It'll be different than if you were doing them all connected. So that's the main reason why it really wouldn't help you even if we took the time. And that's why most indie dyers don't take the time and money to swatch extensively. Now we do try to do our best to swatch and show you swatches when we can or to knit up samples. What I like to do is knit something that I can use at shows where I can show how the colorway works up in a completed project like a shawl or a pair of gloves or something that I'm going to wear like my Swamp Witch sweater that I will actually get a lot of wear and use out of as well as being able to show it off at shows and take photos and put it on Instagram and show how the color works up. That's a much more practical solution even though it takes much longer to knit a whole sweater than just a swatch. This is a much more practical solution for me than trying to knit up swatches of every single one of my colorways. And then when I can, I try to um, refer people to similar ones. So if I have another heavy speckle like this that I dye in the same way and I use the same techniques, just different colors, I would refer someone to a photo on my social media or on my website and say, you know, it's different colors, but it knits up the exact same way because it's the same technique, it's just different colors. So maybe go check out how this one knits up and just try to imagine that instead you have a sky blue background with dark blue and red speckles or whatever it is and that will kind of give you more of an idea. So I hope that helped to answer some questions. Again, this was not meant to be a smackdown. This is not meant to be me taking an attitude and telling you where to get off if you're a consumer or a customer. And especially if you're a customer and you've made that suggestion to me or other indie dyers, please don't take this as me getting all like snippy and lippy with you. But I did want to make that public service announcement because it's the one thing I hear over and over. It's probably in the top three at least, if not the number one question that indie dyers get that just makes us roll our eyes and groan and say, I have to answer this again. And to give all that detail on a social media post is a lot. So some people will take the time to type it all out or like I do type it out somewhere else and then copy and paste it in because I get asked so many times. <laughs> But um, a lot of us just don't have the time to even write a book like that to answer a question on social media or in an email. So we just take the easy way out and either ignore it or just offer a, thank you, I had thought of that, but I don't have time at this point, check back later or something like that. So I hope that helps you a little bit. What I want to leave you with though is an action step what you can do to help this problem, because it doesn't do any good to identify a problem and then be like, yeah, it'd be nice if we all had knit swatches, but we don't. Tough toodles, suck it up, right? <laughs> That wouldn't be very helpful. So what I've done is taken a very easy action step for you. And I know that this is something that I can say without a shadow of a doubt is something every indie dyer out there wants you to do as well. So I think I can speak for the entire community on this one. I don't do that very often, but I think I can today. And that is you can help us with this problem. And I know you know the answer to this already, but every time you knit up a project or a swatch, whatever it is, if it, even if it's just a swatch for your next project, a swatch or a project in any of our indie dyed yarns, take as many great photos as you can from every angle. Um, try to use natural lighting whenever possible to show off the colorways the best way that you can. But if you can't, just use whatever you have. And please, please, please tag your indie dyer when you post that on social media. So whether you're putting that up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, wherever it's at, um, whatever platform you use, make sure that you mention the business name of where you got it from. If possible, if they're on that platform as well, tag them. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube now. Um, so please tag me. And then also, if you can, try to let everybody know what the colorway is. So when I do my Sunset Highway, I'm definitely going to let everybody know that Brittany was the genius behind this and say, go check out Machetti shop. Here's the colorways that I used. She had them in a fading point kit. If the kits are all gone, she sells them as individual colors. And this is what they look like. Um, and then when I knit up my swag, you can bet I'm going to be pimping out my own yarn company and saying, this is Potion Yarns. Isn't it amazing? Go get this awesome colorway over at this, at this website. 
So make sure that you try to keep track of which colorways you have. I know I haven't been great about that on the podcast all the time. Sometimes I get stuff out of stash and then I show you a project I'm wearing or I'm knitting and I can't remember the colorway name, but I'm trying to get better about that. And um, yeah, just help us out because really, even if we were to knit a swatch for everything, like I said, it wouldn't cover how great it looks in an actual project. Swatches can only go so far. They can help you. They're still imp imperative for you as the knitter to plan your projects and make sure they fit and that they get the most out of your yarn. But it's really impractical when you're shopping for yarn. It really is best to just get as much experience as you can and just try to learn to read your skeins like we've been talking about in this podcast. If you've missed previous episodes where we talked about how to read your skein, how to knit from a sock blank, how to know um, the different types of yarn based on their terms and, and how they're referred to, the definitions of the terms. If you've missed any of those videos, please go back and check out my old videos because the last several weeks on the podcast, we have had a lot of information that will really help you when you're purchasing and knitting with Indie Dyed Yarn. Thank you guys for tuning in today and taking the time to listen to my uh, long-winded explanations, but I hope that really has helped you out. And I am so excited to um, head off to Ireland next week. We're leaving next Monday to drive to Chicago and then jump on a plane to go to Ireland. And we will be gone for two weeks. Now, I am not entirely certain what's going to happen with the podcast. My goal is that we would take a pause on the actual podcast podcast, but my YouTube channel will still have vlogs when I'm in Ireland is the goal, but I've never done that before. Certainly not overseas while traveling and not sure of my internet. So I'm going to do my best. If that fails, please make sure that you've still subscribed. Make sure you click that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss a video when I come back because I ha already have some exciting episodes planned and I'm going to be planning even more for the summer. So that uh, new episode will start up the first week of June. As soon as I am back, I believe that will be the 8th of June. I might still have a vlog that week if I am delayed in travel at all, but for sure the week after that we'll be back to regular podcast episodes, but we'll at least get a short video or a vlog or a little something, a how-to or something, the first week of June. In the meantime, hopefully the vlogs will go seamlessly and you will be able to see little snapshots of my trip in Ireland. I will be uploading very, very short little video clips uh, to help you guys take a take a little armchair vacation with me um, and see some of the things that I'm seeing. And then also make sure that you're following my Instagram and my Facebook if you're not already because I am definitely going to be having some live videos on those in Ireland as well as posting some photos still. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm thrilled to be going. I can't wait to share with you guys and I'm hoping to come back really, really refreshed and full of lots of inspiration for some great new colorways and some new podcast episodes. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a lot of success with your indie dyed yarn and thank you so much for joining me. It's time to cast off. Love you.